Clark County Parent Coalition in Peace. And I'm so excited we have an opportunity to hear from David today. And he will give us his wisdom in regards to COVID and how we can um, perhaps learn to deal with some anxiety around that. So I'm excited for David Petoniak to begin. Well, thank you, Brenda. And hi to everybody. Um, see lots of faces and um, looking forward to this time together. And uh, I thought if it was okay with everyone that I would start with a kind of brief presentation of how I approach um, my work, this work, this uh, time we're in. And from there, uh, have a conversation with you about yourself, your kids, anything that would be useful and helpful to you. Uh, I am kind of semi-retired. I've been coming to Clark County for uh, the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, so it's a kind of home away from home for me. Um, and I have a consulting practice that I call Imagine. And it's all about just meeting people, uh, spending time with them, people who are struggling in one way or another in their life. And a manifestation of that is they sometimes have what we would call problem or difficult behaviors. My wife wanted me to tell everybody before we got going too far that I have um, lost a tooth. I can show you. I, I don't know if you can see it in these small boxes, but I've lost a tooth. Um, I lost it before Christmas, but because of COVID, it's taking me forever to get it fixed. Um, Cindy's worry is that if I don't tell you, then you might be uh, distracted and wonder, is he missing a tooth or wonder what happened? But I'd like to tell you it, I jumped out of an airplane or something and broke it, but I actually was eating an ice cream sandwich in December on one of the colder days of December and broke off this old cap I had on my tooth forever. So it's not very, uh, not very glorious, my broken tooth. But now you know, and I'll stop talking about it. My work is really based on this idea that we are a social species. Human beings are social beings. Ours is a social brain. Neuroscientists, the people who study our brain, now tell us that about 80% of what our brain is up to at any given point in time is thinking about social connection. In short, it's not something we do from time to time when we get a moment here or there. It's something we're doing almost all the time. And the reason for this is because our ancestors thankfully learned that cooperative behavior that working alongside one another increase the chances of survival. And after millions of years of evolution, our brain is hardwired for social connection. When we are socially connected, we stand a significantly better chance of living a long and happy life than people who are lonely. We are gonna get sick less often. And when we do, we get better, faster. Uh, if we need to take medicine, we're more likely to take medicine as prescribed when we're socially connected than someone who is lonely or isolated. Um, there's just no getting around it. Being socially connect connected is really important to our well being. And a problem or issue for lots of people who experience disabilities is that they're often on the outside of what is in. They are, through a, for a bunch of cultural reasons, sometimes on the outside of things. They sometimes go to separate schools or separate classrooms within schools. They live with their folks uh, and then go to separate places to spend their day when they grow into adulthood. Um, and I think it's these things um, are not healthy for people. They, we need to be connected. Our well-being is dependent on it. When you are on the outside of what is in, it makes you anxious in your body. And we're understanding these days more and more about anxiety and the role it plays in the body. And that's what I'd like to spend quite a bit of time talking about in relation to this question of COVID. 
when I first started to study anxiety years ago, I was under the impression that anxiety was always a bad thing. That if we could just get it out of our bodies and out of our brains, we'd feel better. But it turns out that's kind of a myth. It turns out that a certain amount of anxiety is actually associated with optimal performance. Our brain does better when it's a little anxious, not too anxious, but a little bit. You might call it right anxiety. A model I like to share with people to help explain this is the model I wanna share with you. So I go to share screen and then click on this. And you can, you all see this now? Is that showing up on your screens? Yes. So, so what you can see, this is a simple model to explain what I think is an amazing concept. But you can see that on the bottom axis is ang the anxiety level. On the left would be low anxiety. On the right would be high anxiety. It's either a little or it's a lot. And on the vertical axis, you see performance. At the bottom, you see low performance. At the top, you see high performance. And what you can see by the shape of this curve is that a certain amount of anxiety, imagine if you drew a straight line up from the word anxiety itself, a certain amount of anxiety is associated with the higher, highest performance. What we know is that our brain works better here. Our brain is more able to recall things or bring things from our memory banks. We're much better problem solvers here. We can see into the future and make predictions about what's a good way to behave, what might not be such a good way to behave. Um, it, in fact, being there uh, helps us to move our body in a more coordinated fashion. We're more coordinated when we're out at that level. But what I want you to notice is that low anxiety is associated with low performance. It's what happens to us when we've had a busy week and we find ourselves on the couch on Friday. Somebody wants to order pizza and we can't even make decisions about the simplest of things, just to order the pizza. I don't care if it's got pineapple on it. You know, that feeling of not even being able to get yourself up off the couch. That's when our anxiety is just not high enough. We're exhausted, we're tired there. Then I want you to notice that if you add a little bit more anxiety to that optimal spot, you begin, we begin to slide off that curve. Uh, in fact, the difference between the right amount of anxiety for us and too much, it just ain't much. And if we get <clears throat> increasingly anxious, in large part because we feel like we're getting increasingly anxious, we get to a place where we're unable to cope. When we're there, physiologically, we've left the thinking brain. We've left the problem-solving brain. In particular, a region of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. This is a remarkable part of our brain, but it helps us to sort things out and to problem-solve. It helps us to pay attention and notice things that we might not have otherwise noticed. When we get there, we leave the brain that allows us to do that. What we say about people who are way out on that anxiety curve, what we say about them is that there is no past. They can't recall anything from memory. And there is no future. They can't project into the future. Everything is immediate and present. And it may be that you've found yourself there before, or you have a loved one who gets there, maybe even with some regularity. What we say about someone who is there is that they're physiologically uh, incapable of problem solving. They're, they've just, their body has shut down the brain that allows them to problem solve. And later, if you're interested, I can tell you why the brain body complex shuts the thinking brain down when we get too far out in that cycle. The work of helping people is to help them move back to reduce their anxiety because when we help them to do that, they rejoin the brain that problem solves. 
So it's moving from that very high level to that, maybe that level right over anxiety. That becomes the work. How do we reduce the physical anxiety in your body versus help you problem solve? Because you can't problem solve. You're not in the part of the brain that problem solves. Notice I have an arrow on this slope. That represents a point I think lots of people who I meet in my practice, people who experience disabilities, they live there. They got more anxiety in their bodies on a good day than I do in my body on a really bad day. And this would explain why one little thing can go wrong or not happen the way they anticipated. And the next thing you know, they're just falling off the cliff. The next thing you know, they're becoming very dysregulated. And what we'll say about them there is we'll say, geez, I don't get what the big deal is. Your brother's just a little late getting home tonight or um, school is just out for teacher conference today. What, what, what is the big deal? But what we don't understand is that the person on a good day has huge charge of anxiety in their system and counts on things going on a regular going in a regular way, going on a regular schedule. If it doesn't or something interrupts it, throws them a loop, the next thing you know, they're just falling off that slope like a snowball going down a hill. I think lots of people we care about live there. Um, and helping people reduce that physical anxiety is a big part of the work. And it's important to understand that a big part of this work is physical work. It hasn't got anything to do with cognitive functioning. So I'm sure I can remind all of you of a time where you've been off that slope, you know, where you are scared or threatened. And the next thing you know, you can't keep a thought straight in your head. A friend of mine just discovered he had cancer. When he was at the doctor's office, he couldn't register a word the doctor was saying. Thankfully, his wife was there to help him put it all together. The doctor who is treating him understood he probably wasn't understanding a thing and promised he would go over it again as many times as he needed. But when you leave this part of your brain that registers information and problem solves, um, uh, you, you just don't register anything. So think of the state of terror you might be in if you just found out you have cancer. Because your wife is less terrified, she's staying in the thinking brain that can absorb the information, though she's terrified too. She's not so terrified that she, so she can register some of it and help make a plan and get things organized. This all makes sense to everybody. So in this time of COVID, there's a couple things to notice. One is that we are all uh, anxious. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons for this, not the least of which uh, there's a virus out there that for a good part of the time could kill us. I've got both my vaccinations, so I feel way more confident than I did six months ago. But we're in a society that's gone through something societies don't go through very often. It's a once every hundred year sort of phenomena. Hopefully it won't happen any more frequently than that. But the bottom line is there's all kinds of reason for us to be anxious, a little terrified, and we've all kind of moved out on that slope. Then when you're out there, you're kind of exhausted by it. It's hard to sleep well, hard to get into routines or rituals, and that's so predictable during COVID. It also, one of the things that helps us the most is social connection. And often we can't see the people we've historically depended on the most. We can talk to them thankfully by phone or maybe by Zoom, but it just ain't the same as holding someone's hand and being right there. I don't know about you, but I'm frequently going to my grocery store and someone will say, hi, David, and I will have no idea who they are because they're wearing a mask. They'll dip the mask down a little bit from their face so that I can see their face and then I get it. But we're all relying on this social information on a regular basis to keep us well self-regulated. And we've all been without it for, or without what we're used to for a good 12 plus months now. So it's a formula for a whole society to be anxious and 
worried and troubled. It's, there's, it's very normal for us to feel this way. Healing is about reconnecting because when we do connect with someone, it calms down our central nervous system dramatically. You, I know I've had times where I've been nervous about something or scared about something, times when I was on the road and I'd fly home. And as soon as I saw my wife on the porch waiting for me, I felt better. I immediately felt better without saying a word to her, without getting any ideas from her about what I might do. Just seeing her made me instantaneously feel better. And that's just evidence of how strong social connections are to us. So lots of people we care about, it might be your kids or friends who have disabilities, even before COVID or before all of the pandemic stuff was happening, they may have had less people in their life who can help do that, calm down their central nervous system. It's a formula for being way out on that edge. Now, let me see about stopping the share. I just wanna periodically check in with you and make sure that what I'm saying is making sense. Is this making sense so far? No? Good. So the work is to help people calm down the physical body. And let me share with you a couple of things that really help to do that in addition to just being socially connected. It also really helps to move aerobically, to get our heart rate up and maintain that for a period of time. It doesn't even have to be long, but aerobic activity is one of the best ways of calming down anxiety in the body because it's about physically changing the landscape of the body by getting a little bit of exercise, even going for a, a slow walk around the block. We literally change our ca carbon dioxide levels in our bloodstream and calm the central nervous system down as a result. A problem for a lot of us is we're over oxygenating. We're breathing really short, shallow breaths. We got too much oxygen in our body and it's part of what's jacking up our system. So anything you can do, anything that's soothing for you or gets you to move some of that energy when you can um, is a great idea. In our culture, we have lots of people who exercise each and every day. They fall apart if they didn't. Uh, and this is because they're self-medicating for uh, anxiety or depression. Uh, and they're doing among the most effective, best things you can do for anxiety or depression. So what I wanted to just share were just a few of the ideas, uh, and some of them will be really familiar to you, like get some exercise, get a good night's sleep if you can, eat well. All these things really help the body to be more resilient when it's overwhelmed by anxiety. Uh, another is to reach out to people you care about. Um, uh, that goes a long way, but you may have individually ways that are soothing for you. It might be, for example, a good warm bath does you a world of good. And you're a parent, so you don't give yourself time anymore to take warm baths. I say you've never needed a warm bath more than you do right now. It's all about calming down the physical body in every way that you can. Uh, I believe people who have disabilities are living in bodies that are, are just uh, way out on that edge. And it's one of the reasons why people typically don't have live as long as people typical in their development. Um, people are significantly more likely to get sick and then take a longer period of time to recover from the illness. All those things we've said about people with disabilities for years are often symptomatic of being on the outside of what is in and living in a body that's really anxious. Structure and predictability is probably one of those things you already know a lot about. When your brain and body are anxious and a little on edge, having predictable things happening in your future soothes the central nervous system. We, we love order. The human loves order and ritual. Um, even when we're not anxious, we love order and ritual because it helps make part of this world we live in just predictable. And that's what we need is we need to calm down some of the chaos that's all around us. 
finally, I just want to say, and then again, I'll open it up to any thoughts or questions you might have. The default setting for the human brain, when the human brain feels anxiety inside the body, the default setting is to assume the source of the threat is coming from outside the body. So our ancestors, uh, they're wandering around on the Serengeti and if they felt uncomfortable in their gut, their brain was programmed to look around, like become hyper attentive to the surroundings because there'd be some chance there was a predator in there that they could run and escape from. Um, it was a, it's a very adaptive response. It's an evolutionary um, um, strategy that does us a world of good. But sometimes the source of anxiety is not external to us, but coming from inside. And our brain still does that same thing. It assumes that the source of the anxiety is external. This is why your kids or friend might be kind of grumpy and take it out on you. Uh, that's what our brain is programmed to do, is to assume that the reason I feel irritated in my body is because of something you're doing. And you, if you're with someone who's in a really anxious state, you have to learn as best you can not to take this personal. It's just what our brain is trained to do. A friend of mine, Al Vecchione, who's a wonderful resource, um, and I'll, I can share with you a website that he's developed about helping to calm the body down. But Al says one time he was at a meeting where it, a meeting that was a routine, regular kind of meeting at the in the state of Vermont. He'd been at these meetings a million times before, always the same people. He said, but at this one meeting he was at, he felt really irritated by people. He was just something was bothering him about what people were saying or how they were saying it. But when he thought about that, he goes, they're not saying anything that's particularly controversial or they're not saying it any differently than they ever think about it. Why am I getting so irritated? And because Al thinks about this kind of stuff all the time, he kept thinking about that. Why was I so bothered by Petoniak in that meeting or by Bill Ash? Why, why, was they, why were they bothering me that much? And he thought about it. He said, for about an hour. <coughs> and then about an hour later, he came down with a fever. And what was happening was he was catching something, a flu bug or something. And his body, before it registered a high fever, was noticing this thing has shown up. And what his brain was trained to do when his body became unsettled was to assume that the source of his threat or discomfort was external to him. It was Petoniak in the meeting or Bill Ash. It all made perfect sense. I tell you this just because it's really common for people who are have high states of anxiety to be grumpy. Uh, uh, they not only don't feel good in their bodies and aren't getting enough rest, but they also are equipped with this evolutionary system that just tells you, you better be, the source of your anxiety is coming from somewhere else that ain't you. And part of what the strategy is for dealing with COVID in these difficult times is for us to develop the skill of checking in with our physical body on a routine basis and learning some strategies that give us confidence we can calm it down when we need to. Now, I won't go into detail about this, but for example, yoga is considered one of the most effective treatments of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a major anxiety disorder um, that there is. Um, yoga is incredible because what it does is it helps people develop some confidence that they can calm their physical body down. We all need it, whether we do it through yoga or we go fishing uh, on the Columbia for a while, or we've just got strategies like a warm bath and lighting some candles, all those things that kind of routinely get you to come down a notch or two are really useful when you're in high stress situations because what you have confidence about, and Brenda wrote about this, but what you have confidence about is that should you need to, you can calm your system down. And that's what people who have disabilities need is they need some strategies that will help them develop some confidence that they can calm their physical body down. So let me stop there and check in with you and see if there are any thoughts or questions I can't tell from my screen how many people are here, 
but it looks about 21. Is that right? Did you say, Brenda? So is this all making sense? I don't, I'm hoping it does. There are not any questions in the chat, um, but I've seen some nodding that it's making sense. <laughs> If we could go back, <clears throat> let me see, I have to do share screen again. And you have the graph in front of you, anxiety. It's not a graph, really. It's just a model to explain this. Yes. Um, a couple of things happen when we become really anxious and get to that place where we're unable to cope. And among other things is our ability to process sound is significantly diminished. This is why directors of movies like Steven Spielberg and Saving Private Ryan, when the soldiers were arriving in under all kinds of gunfire and assault, uh, Steven Spielberg gradually reduced the volume around you until it was just all kind of quiet and in slow motion. This is a strategy by our brain to reduce the terror, is to reduce sound. It's among the first casualties. So if you have a loved one, or if it's true of yourself, who gets out there in the, on that slope, chances are they're not hearing anything you're saying to be calming. It's going in one ear and out the other. The, it's literally, if they are hearing sound, the part of the brain that processes language is also significantly impaired. We lose our ability, even if we can hear the words, to actually process what the words mean. My friend who found out he has cancer is actually my brother. I don't know why I said my friend in the beginning. I felt like I was giving something away about him. But, um, you know, it, it's like he could hear the doctor talking, but he had no idea what the doctor was saying. And the reason for this is because he left the language center. Um, only when you calm down a bit do you return to the part of the brain that can process language. But I think lots of people we care about, their fundamental problem with receptive language is that they're so terrified they can't process what they're hearing. When they do calm down, and maybe you've noticed this with your kid or friend, um, uh, um, I know a million stories of someone with a disability who doesn't speak much or has a hard time using very many words to get a thought expressed, who might be sitting with their mom or dad on a couch watching an old movie and all of a sudden says the most brilliant things. Mom or dad look at their kid and go, my God, where did that come from? It's probably because uh, they had a rare opportunity to calm down this threat uh, potential out there, this terror in their bodies and all of the systems that help you move language you became engaged with again. Now, of course it doesn't, there's all kinds of reasons why people have trouble with expressive or receptive language. This is just one of them. I think way more common than we realize. It's also true when people take tests that uh, if you don't account for the fact that they might be in a state of terror, you're really not testing them accurately. So good testers do things to get to know a person beforehand and help the person to feel some confidence before actually running a test. Then they have a much better picture of what the person does and doesn't understand because the person's in the brain that understands things. If you're curious, the reason why we leave the thinking brain when we feel too terrified is in a nutshell because we need the calories. Our brains, which are a small part of us, our brains I think on average make up about two and a half percent of our total body weight, but our brains on average burn about 25% of our calories every day. So a small part of our body is burning huge numbers of calories. 
and particularly a region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is a thin, only a tenth of an inch thick layer brain that rests right over the top of our brains. If you've ever seen pictures of the brain, it looks like gauliflower. There are two hemispheres, a left and right. What they don't show on these models is the prefrontal cortex because it's so thin, it'd be hard to model it. It'd be hard to get it to show up. It's tiny. Evolutionary bi biologists believe that the prefrontal cortex came into being about 80,000 years ago, which in evolutionary time is no time at all. And nature's still trying to figure out the most efficient way of wiring it. Our eyes have been in our head for millions of years, and we can process visual information very easily. This is why when you see visual charts or see a cartoon or see art, it's so much easier to remember that later than it is to remember written language, because written language is processed by another region of the brain, and it's very calorie hungry. Nature hasn't had a way of uh, quite working out our prefrontal cortex yet, so it's pretty inefficient. We wear hats in the winter on the top of our head because this region of the brain gives off a huge amount of heat. Uh, we have all kinds of capillaries running to this region just to cool it down because it burns huge numbers of calories. That's why when there's a tiger in the room or when you crossed over that line, uh, that's why the thinking brain is among the first casualties. The auditory system and the thinking brain are among the first casualties because what nature is saying is you need every calorie you can get your hand on, shut it down right now. This is why it's really hard for a lot of people to process what they've gone through when they've gone through trauma. They often leave the brain that registers memory. It's not that they have forgotten anything. It's that they never registered a memory of it in the first place because it happened so quickly. So I think lots of people I meet in my work, they live out there with some routine. <clears throat> I always tell people that if I could feel in my body what a person I'm spending time with feels in theirs for even just five minutes, I wouldn't be surprised they're having a hard time. I'd be absolutely amazed at how much they're holding it together. So part of the learning of this is for people to realize they are in fact warriors. They are managing lots of anxious energy. We look at them and think what's wrong, but we're not experiencing in our bodies what they're experiencing in theirs. And if we did, we wouldn't manage ourselves well at all. So a lot of people, once they start to hear that story, you might say that narrative, they begin to get more confident and confidence helps them uh, to uh, stop themselves from having such strong reactions. So let me just check in with you again. We have two questions in the chat. Okay. Um, so many youth can't succeed in online, online school. Do you have any ideas for mitigating the stress? of this kids have trouble did you say brenda uh, yeah. with online stuff yes yeah um i do too um it's mm -hmm. very hard for me to process information that i'm seeing on a screen um i'm not a fan of i'm, I'm fine doing zoom i don't want any of you to take it personally but it's much easier for me to be in a room and available to people to get a sense of what's going on than it does to look at things electronically. Some people um, can read stuff off a screen beautifully and have no problem with it. In fact, for some people, uh, the screen is less threatening because they're not, in, they're not feeling the social pressure to fit in. Uh, so they can actually process information better online. Um, the strategies that I think are important is imagine that the problem for a kid, excuse me, who is uh, um, really anxious and uh, is having trouble concentrating on the, uh, excuse me, the online school stuff. A problem for them is that they're just in this general state of anxiety and they don't have any practice feeling anxious, but directing their attention towards whatever is being presented. And that's what they need is some practice. If you can't handle it at all, uh, what you need is a little bit of practice where you handle it some. So I think the best strategy for kids, particularly those who have trouble with attention, 
is to give them short periods of time where they do their online school, take a break, come back. If the body after a while gets used to the idea, oh, going over there and turning on my computer does not mean sitting there for hours, um, they'll, you, I, most kids, you'll start to see an improvement in their attention, their ability to focus on things. But part of what happens for kids is as soon as they sit down and the computer goes on, they go, this is endless. I'll never be able to escape this. I'll never be able to do the things like walk around that really help soothe me and calm me down. So I would just build it in. I have a lot of short breaks. I'd rather have a kid actually concentrating for 20 minutes on his or her schoolwork than to be absolutely rebelling against doing work for seven hours. It, it, the more you practice, the more you feel soothed by it, like it won't overwhelm me, the easier it is to bring your attention into uh, play. And Brenda, you said there was, I don't know if that's helpful to whoever asked the question, but you also mentioned there was a second question, I think. Yes, the second question is, how does depression affect anxiety levels or vice versa? Many people are diagnosed with both and have to try and cope. That's a great question. And what we're learning is that um, there's a lot of overlap between depression and anxiety. Um, in fact, anxiety is often treated with the SSRI medications because they help people with depression, but they also help people with just too much energy in their body. Not everybody, but some people. And vice versa, sometimes people that are have primarily have anxiety um, are less depressed after they uh, do things like aerobically work out a lot. There's a lot of overlap between all of these systems, but anxiety is the one that overwhelms the body um, with energy. And I, I let me, if I could, I'll show you a, a, another slide. Human beings, when they are anxious, uh, basically have three options. The first option is to reach out, and that is by far the most desirable option to a social species like us. Reaching out is the single best thing you can do. When that fails, though, people act out. And if that fails sufficiently, people shut down. So think about your son or daughter or friend or yourself and the whole work becomes, how can we help you to learn the benefit of reaching out? This is why being nurturing and being helpful is so useful because once people learn, oh, this is soothing, this will help me calm down, they don't need to resort on the second and third strategy. These are some things you might say to someone, your son or daughter, if they've had a hard time. I got my cursor seems to have disappeared somehow. Uh, let me see if my arrow key will work. I seem to have frozen up. And show let me escape. They're all finding out that my mom and dad's anniversary is coming up. Um, I don't know why, but my screen seems frozen. I'm going to stop share. Now I have you back. But I can't find my cursor anymore. Huh. I have no idea what just happened, Brenda, do you? Any came up since I've been away? I just want to make sure I'm making oh, sense. You were speaking about how depression and anxiety um, oh. work or not work together. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. There's an awful lot of overlap between the two of them in the research now. Um, and it's almost always the case that people who have gone through trauma have a combination of both. It would, it's normal, for example, to have depression if you've gone through traumatic experience or events in your life. It's a normal human response to 
um, uh, trauma. Um, I had a professor one time, a long time ago in psychopathology who said the difference between the brain of a person who has depression and the person who's sort of normal in every way, it's not huge and fundamental. He said, imagine you took a pipette and uh, filled it with fluid. One of those drops is probably the difference between a person with depression and a person who's um, hardwired the way most of us are. And, and finding systems that help to heal that or regulate that is a big part of what the work is. As I mentioned, I think I mentioned anyway before, one of the single most effective things you can do, treatments of depression or anxiety is aerobic activity. It's unbelievable how much that changes our biophysiology. You were actually uh, speaking about the reach out, act out, or shut down options of um, behavior. Yes. Um, those are the two strategies really available to humans, to a, 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 um, the species. Um, and by far, the first and most adaptive is to reach out. Um, if you were all sitting in a room together, for example, and I just randomly left the room, the first thing you would do is think, did he just go? And then the next thing you do is look at each other to get confirmation. Did I miss something? Uh, and it's because we're so organized in our social brain, we're always referencing ourselves to others to figure out what's the right way to respond. And this is a really wonderful adaptive thing our species has done. If we were all individuals who went our own way, we'd be screwed as a society. It's way too complex for us to all be individuals. Uh, we can all be individuals, but this part of us that worries what other people think or uh, wants to fit in is very adaptive. It's very adaptive. So David, I have a question for you that has to do with that personal experience. So I have um, general, generalized anxiety as a diagnosis. And um, I one of the things that people are often told to try is mindfulness practice. And so I, I took on uh, mindfulness meditation practice. And for the first year, really the experience was just sitting still in an absolute state of anxiety that it was all I could do not to get up and run out of the room while I was doing the meditation. Um, and, and I feel like, and, but eventually it did, you know, I was able to achieve a state of calm. And I don't know if it's um, that I just learned that I could tolerate that anxiety and get to the other side of it, or if, if you feel like there are other mechanisms, but I know a lot of times it's recommended, but it's such a difficult thing to do for somebody with anxiety. It is, it is. Um... I'll tell you a short story that I think will help uh, explain, maybe help explain this. Um, there's a young man, his name is John, who sometimes comes and visits us. His family lives in central Virginia. And um, I just love him, but he's, he's in the stratosphere in terms of anxiety. He's just jacked up. He likes to come visit. We go for hikes around the mountain and cook food outside on a fire and he loves it. We love him, but he's a pretty anxious guy. And about, I think it's been now about seven years, I started going uh, to a yoga practitioner in our community who I just fell in love with, who was just really helpful to me. She had a wonderful way of explaining things and showing me a practice that helped me to calm my physical state down. Her name is Jennifer Speeden. And um, it occurred to me one time, John was gonna come visit, that it would be kind of cool if he came with me and we went and saw Jennifer. I'd be, I thought to myself, it'd be probably really helpful to him and I'd be really interested in Jennifer and what she thinks about John, et cetera. So I asked Jennifer, do you mind if John comes along with me next time? And she, oh, I'd love to meet him. And when I went 
next door we have a cabin beside our house. We went next door to get him, he was there with his mom and he was like in a state of fury. He was pissed off because he wanted to get some Mountain Dew soda and his mother told him he can't have Mountain Dew soda because it makes him too anxious and fucking bitch, she should let me have Mountain Dew and she's standing right there and I'm like, you know, don't worry about it. We'll get some Mountain Dew after yoga. You can get a case of it if you want. I don't give a shit. Let's just go to yoga. So we got in my truck and drove all the way to her yoga studio. And he was just, you're going to stop and get Mountain Dew, aren't you? are going to stop and get Mountain Dew. And I said, yeah, there's a shell station along the way. When we get done yoga, we'll stop there and get you a couple six packs. You know, he actually said, probably I have just get a couple six packs because it does get me kind of wired. So already he's beginning to, you know, think this through on his own as opposed to being mad at his mother for saying no. So then we go to see Jennifer and uh, he walks into her studio and almost instantaneously he calms down. It was remarkable to see, to witness, but he just calmed down. And we now know there are reasons for this. One is that Jennifer really takes care of herself. She's a very mindful, uh, committed practitioner. So she's, she, she, uh, she does what she talks about doing. And when you see her, you just feel like you're in the presence of somebody who's just really grounded and she's not special. She's not like trying to be a guru or anything. She's just, she looks like, you know, a person who's taking care of herself. That's the first thing I notice about her every time I see her. She actually lives this. And what we know from the research is that what the human brain does is it references itself to other humans and picks those models that look like they're healthy because it greatly increases the chances of survival, longevity. So we are programmed on a cellular level to find that appealing because if we practice that or copy that or mimic that, it increases the chances not only that we'll survive, but the whole pack will survive. So it you could just see it come over him. He just looked at her with this kind of curiosity. And she asked him a bunch of questions about himself. She asked him, for example, uh, have you ever done yoga? And he said, no, I've never done yoga, but I do uh, a martial arts form. And he named one from South Korea that is a really like obscure martial art form. My son Joe later said, oh my God, there really is that martial arts form. I had never heard of it before. And he said, I have a black belt in it. And she said, oh, how did you get the, your black belt? Did you go to training? He goes, no, I learned it on Wii, you know, the computer game. That... And Jennifer, in that moment, she smiled, but not in a way that was laughing at him, but a way that really appreciated, you know, doing this work, I get to meet the most amazing people. Well, the next thing I know, she's got him doing all these poses she's been trying for the previous three or four years to get me to do, and he's doing them beautifully. It's like all she says is move your right hip there and this, and he does it. It's stuff she's been trying to get me to do, but I'm so uncoordinated with, oh, my right hip, what do you mean? My, you know, I'm just disoriented from my body. And I swear to God, she, she, believes this isn't true, but I swear to God, at one point she looked at me like, if you were really listening to me, this is what you'd be doing. It was just amazing to me how much he got it. And the next thing I know, he's as calm as he can possibly be on the floor. It's time for us to leave. He says, namaste to Jennifer. We get in the car. He's a different human being. He's so calm in his body and we go by, I, I go by the uh, shell station, I pull in to get him some Mountain Dew and he says to me, you need gas? And I go, no, I'm stopping to get you some Mountain Dew. He had forgotten about the Mountain Dew. He still wanted it, but he had totally forgotten about it. He was so mellow. And when we got back to the cabin, uh, his mother was at the front door and she saw him from a distance because you park your truck down at the end of a hill. She saw him from a distance and she just went like this to me, she went, what's happened? I said, I know, it's amazing. And he was mellow, and comfortable for the rest of the evening. He got a good night's sleep. It was just miraculous. Now, the next morning, he was furious at his mother about something else and raving, raging about her. And Well, I said to him, hey, let's go down to, we've got this little yoga studio. I said, let's go down to the, and trust me, it's just a storage building that we have some mats laid out in. 
Dude, let's go down and practice some of that yoga from yesterday. I don't want to fuck you. I'm not going to do it. I don't need to do it. It's, I, you son of a bitch. I'm not going to do it. It's not going to work for me. I said, come on. I want to learn how to teach people to do this. Just come with me. And to make a long story short, I got him to come. We practiced, <coughs> we practiced some of the postures that he had done the day before. It seemed to calm him down so much, but it didn't work. Not one thing worked. He was just cranky as he could be. So later, the next time I saw Jennifer, I mentioned this to her. I said, you know, she was so calm when he saw you. And then I get to my house and he's angry about something. I say, you know, let's practice some of the yoga. And none of it helped. None of it helped. I said, I don't get what I was doing wrong. And the first thing she said is you weren't paying attention to his body. What you were paying attention to were strategies. You got hooked up on strategies. Like if you do this posture this way, and that's what we have a tendency to do, especially us in the helping profession. We get addicted to strategies and we're not paying attention to where people are at physiologically. He was in the stratosphere, even more so than when we went to see Jennifer in the first place. So I said, so what would you have done? She said, I might have gone for a walk with him, like a vigorous walk, try to dampen down some of that excess arousal. And maybe he would have been open to doing some yoga, maybe not. It would have worked just getting him to blow off some of this steam. And so I share that with you, that sometimes physiologically, we're just not available to certain things that are can be helpful to us generally or a good part of the time. And there are other strategies to look for when that happens. So Jennifer works with people who have disabilities and there's a young woman, her name is Becky and Becky has a long history of trauma. And uh, there's a posture that I find very comforting where I lay on my back and I ju it just calms me down. Um, but J Jennifer wanted to teach that to Becky but Becky became hyper aroused when she did. And it's probably because a history of trauma laying down in that vulnerable way is just not comfortable to you. So Jennifer had her do similar postures or poses from a seated position. Jennifer does things like takes bags of rice, heavy bags, and puts them on Becky's legs, which gets Becky to come into her body and focus on different parts of her body. And she's been really helpful to Becky, but she's always watching what is Becky's body doing. And that's what Jennifer does when I go to see her. She's looking at me when I walk in the door and making judgments about things that might help me today and things that probably won't work with Petoniac today. But I think that's the place we need to get. And we have to you know, carry to your question. I think we have to kind of recognize it in ourselves that sometime we're just physically not available to one strategy, but it may be there are other things that can be really helpful. Thank you, David. Jennifer, you're welcome. Jennifer is the last person on earth that'll tell you you should do a yoga pose when you ought to go for a, a fast walk through the woods. But she's doing what I think increasingly uh, modern psychology, uh, where we're heading, I think, in terms of how to figuring out how to help people. Uh, with all kinds of emotional struggles is looking more and more about the physical body. It's driven so much by the physical body. Any other thoughts or questions about any of this? I mentioned to you before uh, a website developed by Al Vecchione in Vermont. He works with people who have disabilities all the time. And he's been really interested in, can we develop some strategies that help people calm down their central nervous system that people can learn um, uh, wherever they happen to be cognitively. Uh, and it's a really brilliant site. And I'd show it to you on my PowerPoint thing, but I'm afraid I'll lose you if I try to go there again, so I'm just not gonna do it. But the, I can remember the address, and the address is Taming the Tiger, all one word, VT, all part of that one word, Taming the Tiger VT, like Victor, Tom, as in Vermont, dot org. 
if you if dot org doesn't do it try dot com i i sometimes get mixed up but i think it's dot org and it's a series of 15 or 20 videos where first you meet al and he explains to you why this particular strategy is helpful and then um shows you demonstrates it and then many times shows video of people learning it and practicing it for the first time but it's a really brilliant site i highly highly recommend it taming the tiger vt.org i think it's dot com i just looked it up thank you thank you Any other thoughts or questions? Anything you all can do in these COVID times to reconnect with your people, whoever they might be, it's a good idea. Anything you can do that practice that helps soothe the body, calm it down, good idea. And some things are, it's really amazing how effective they are, for example, singing uh, helps change the carbon dioxide level in our bloodstream and will calm us down. So Al's got a video of driving home. He says, when I go home after a day's work, said, I'm gonna see my wife, Linda. He says, I sing in the car a good part of the way just so I can be in the right space when I see her. And he'll share with you all the research uh, that supports this. He's a very, very evidence-based kind of guy. He just thinks a lot of what we've done traditionally in our psychological services has been just BS, that only when people start thinking about the physical body and how all this stuff impacts the physical body and then what happens to the thinking brain when those systems get into high gear, that's where we're going. I believe that's where we're going. There's another comment in the chat. Um, working from home has been tough on us because we don't have that transition into and out of work mode. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good 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 observation. Um, when we were working in workplaces, there was time it took us to get back home that really helped us in the transition. And often that's just completely missing. We're literally going from one Zoom conference to the next. We're talking to people like we are now. And then we're Zooming with our family members later. And we haven't gotten up out of the chair or out of the house. So what I've learned to do is to be pretty deliberate about transition time. I, for example, had a little break between an earlier meeting and this one. And I just went for a walk with the dog. Um, and just felt like I was in a much better place by the time we we hooked up with each other than I would have been if I had just stayed in my office and gone on to the next task. It's amazing what a little aerobic exercise, uh, even a small amount, will do to change your physiology. It's just amazing. But that question about transitions, I think you would what we have to do during this time, I'm sorry, Brenda, I cut you off. Um, but during this trans during this time, particularly when we're kind of at home a lot, we just got to be deliberate about putting some space in between things and then having something specific that we do that helps us just shift gears a little bit. I had a comment and then there was there is a comment in the chat, but I read something recently that was helpful. Um, to that encouraged us to even celebrate and or and or at least very much acknowledge whatever your work schedule is that you still recognize it okay okay now it's friday night even if i've just gone from the couch to the kitchen at least now it's friday night so now i will um just acknowledge that that, that there's the end of the work week or um and then it's a great idea give yourself permission to have some actual time off the two 
comments in the chat. One is um, in an effort to learn to help my son, I probably need the help myself. And then I, you would probably say, David, you have to help yourself before you can help your, your Absolutely. loved one. Absolutely. And then, you know, Brenda, my favorite quote about this is from, now I'm going to forget who said it, Jean uh, Clark. She said, a person's needs are best met by people whose needs are met. So it's, it's really important if you're in a caregiving role with any regularity that you do things to take care of yourself. The next question is, I work with preschoolers in the classroom. How do I help them understand COVID? Like why life is changing and what is happening? This is this is from Judy and I have a actual a comic book that addresses this if you wanted to connect with me after this and I can forward it to you but I'm sure David has a great answer. I don't really have a great answer except that I know there are a lot of resources that have come out of uh, Center for Disease Control that are for kids specifically of young ages ways to explain things to them. So uh, that comic book sounds wonderful, Brenda, and I think there are storytelling books and little movies and stuff to help kids understand it who are, you know, too early to understand any complexity about a virus, but can learn about taking care of each other and why we have to be careful and all those things. It's a great question, though, because, you know, little people are experiencing this whole thing. And one benefit they have is that it all seems pretty normal to them. It doesn't occur to them that they're supposed to be getting out of the house and doing a bunch of stuff. But, um, but there are ways, I think, to help them that are available now that even a, six months ago weren't available. So I just checked that out. Resources for kids during COVID might be a starting point. We have, um, I work for public health and we have this little card on five senses that we hand out to clients with high anxiety um, to try help them get regrounded or re-regulated. Um, and it talks about, you know, to stop and you like five things you smell, five things you hear, my dog barking, five things you take. Things you hear. <laughs> and, and I know sometimes clients get really anxious because I, I can't smell five things. I can't, I can't do it that, you know, so we're, we break it down, just do one thing. But do you ever use that practice, the five senses it, to try to reground them? It's a great practice. And I find it helpful for myself when I get particularly anxious, bringing my attention, conscious attention to what's going on immediately around me really serves me well. When people are so anxious, they can at best, just do one, I just help them with two or three of the others. I just, oh, I also notice that there's a pink square over here, isn't there? I, anything that brings people's attention to what's happening in the present con, begins to calm the central nervous system down. So it's a great idea. Weighted things help. Anything that brings our attention to the physical body tend, tend to help. I know that does help my grandson who has cerebral palsy because um, when he gets upset or overwhelmed, he loses words and he can't he can't communicate anymore. So going through some of these steps, um, you can just see the transition in his body calming. Yeah, and see when he, and he adults yeah. both use it. I, Jan, I'm sorry I started talking. I think I interrupted you. What was that last thing you said? Oh, I just said I've, I've just seen it work real, really well with kids and adults both. They both can, can grasp that concept because, like you said before, the past and the future no longer exist and even words uh, fail you. So yeah. you, you leave the brain that processes all those things and it doesn't take long. It's, you know, it gets triggered fast for a lot of people, especially people who have kind of a routine um, of falling apart 
that it's so they're so familiar with that body state that when it shows up, it doesn't surprise them in any way. They it's almost like they can't escape the groove of it because they're so um, uh, familiar with it. Uh, Brenda mentioned in the flyer uh, these habitual uh, forms of thought we get into. One of the reasons we tend to think about things the same way over and over again is because they are familiar. They're easy to easier to process than staying put and going there's mystery in the world. So the more anxious we get, the more likely it is we're going to go to a, one of our familiar habits. Um, the, uh, I was going to say something about that and I just forgot. Um, yoga has been particularly helpful to people with post-traumatic stress disorder, and in particular, the more severe uh, forms of it, the more reactionary forms of it. What was happening before is through modern therapies, people were trying to get the person who experienced trauma to talk about what took place. But the problem for them is as soon as they started to revisit that, they just triggered that whole uh, reaction, shut down the thinking brain, and they were gone. So what people did in this, yoga, teaching people yoga, which turned out to be way more effective than any of the uh, uh, pharma pharmaceuticals that were applied, way more effective than individual or group therapy, is what it did was it said, when I'm going to talk about this stuff, we just want to help you uh, train your breath to be more steady. And they practiced in short ways, no mention of trauma or anything like that. But when people got fairly good or reliable strategies for calming their central nervous system down, most of the major symptoms um, were um, remediated or ameliorated. They were, they were just shocked at the, um, the results. It's all about change the body, you'll change the mind. We, we come from a Western tradition of change the mind, change the way you think about it, and then you'll calm your body down. Now physiologists are saying, oh, good luck trying to calm down the physical body. It's like a racehorse and our thinking brain is like a jockey on top of a racehorse. The idea that the jockey has any physical control over the racehorse is nonsense. So our emotional system, our physical system is way more powerful. It's all really about just getting some confidence, we can keep it calm and then telling, we'll just tell ourselves a story about why that works, but it's all about just the routine of it. The, I know on a regular basis, I can calm myself down. I get less anxious in a big way over time. I promised Brenda that I would share, by the way, some of the slides uh, from before, and um, on the back of that will be some resources that you might find helpful, um, uh, including a book by a guy named um, Vanderkoop called uh, "The Body Keeps Score." Keeps the score, and it's all about. He was a kind of Western-trained drug researcher who got paid millions of dollars to test these drugs coming out of the pharmaceutical industry. And what he was disappointed by was they just really weren't working over and over again. They, they, weren't that, they weren't that helpful. And he's an ethical guy. So he you know, just said, I wonder if there's anybody who is having any luck with folks who are in this place physiologically. That's when he found people practicing yoga and learned about it. Now there's a chapter in that book about just yoga and why they think uh, it has such uh, potential, why it's been so helpful to people. David, you let us know when you'd like to stop recording if you want to take people's questions. Uh, uh -oh. Right now, we don't have any particular ones in the chat. Okay, well, we can do that now if you'd like, Brenda. I forgot all about that. So um, if you've been holding back or wanting